care about these motherfuckers. It's time to f***ing go. All I want to do is f***ing eat. If we're not practicing the beat, somebody, we're practicing the beat. Everybody. Nowhere to run and nowhere to hide for four quarters. They got to see us in our house for four quarters. They got to look us in the eye for four. This is about us and our family and our house. This is about us. This is our mentality. We ain't backing down. We ain't running. Set a tone. Send a message. This is our house. Physical toughness wins in football now. And if you in this room, you got it. If you come in here, you better believe in it. Because this physical toughness is what makes the difference. Elite focus. That's all I'm doing to the guy across from me. I'm fixing to whip his ass. Not in my box. Not today. It's about us. It's about our family. We attack. You take that helmet and you strike him. And you strike him. And you strike him. That's how you get respect. No, I don't want to pick the shit out of him. Physically, physically, I want to break him. It's that kind of week, everybody. Welcome back in to another edition of How About That Dogs Cast. This is the week. This is the week where all that stuff that we hear Coach tell us every week in that open, it's about me, my job, it's about us. That dude in the box across from me, I'm about to whip his ass. That's what this is about. I say that because if you're going to defeat the team that the dogs are facing this week, it comes down to you versus the guy across from you. That's what it comes down to. That just gets me all kinds of ready to go. That's what football is at its most basic form. Coach said it at the podium this week for his press conferences. He just said, look, you can't stop them unless you whip them. I'm paraphrasing just a little bit. You have to be willing to strike a man, shed a block, make a play. The dogs have done that really well over the last two years against a Josh Heupel Tennessee team. This Saturday, we find out how much has changed. This Georgia football team is a problem. It is a problem for the rest of college football right now. This team... They had their missed starts. Maybe they weren't hitting on all cylinders at the first part of the season. But some of us were out here telling you, sort of pulling people back from the edge, saying, it's okay, hang in there. This is going to work out just like you think it should. That looked a long ways away for some folks a little while back. But now you look up, and we're sitting here in the middle of November and all those struggles that the team had due to new people in new places or yeah, the injury bug was a bit of a problem or maybe we're just still sort of figuring each other out. All of that stuff seems to be coming together right here when it matters most. This Georgia football team is a problem. Not only are they getting healthy, I mean, let's just think about what's happened over the last three weeks, certainly after last week. At the time of the season, when other teams are starting to feel the pinch of the injury bug, or maybe they're beginning to question whether or not they have enough gas to actually get to the finish line. Maybe they, you know, when they fill the tank, they, they were good for 10 weeks, but when you start looking at 12, they're not sure if they're going to get there. Or if they do, they're certainly not going to be racing across the finish line. While that's happening across the country, as I sit back in this chair and I think about it, it's hard for me to see another team out there that appears to be surging within the way that these Georgia Bulldogs are. This Georgia football team is a problem. They just looked across the roster and said, you know what? This is who we are. We're pretty good. We're sitting here at 8-0. You know what? Let's add in our starting running back. Drop him in there. While we're at it, let's go ahead and plug in a couple of first-round talents to see if we can make this machine operate more efficiently, a little bit faster, 
a little bit stronger. Anybody else around the country doing that right now? I don't think so. This Georgia football team is going to be a problem. Carson Beck, who, again, if you're, no, if you're not new here, you know that I've been telling you for months, since February, since we launched this endeavor, Carson Beck is not the part of any of this that I was concerned about. And man, has he answered that in spades. Has he shown exactly who he is? Depending on the metric you look at, especially the PFF metrics, Carson Beck is rating out as an elite talent at quarterback this season in the way he's throwing the football down the field. Not good. Not a little bit better than average. Elite. And what was that I just said about the team around him is getting better? This Georgia football team is a problem for the rest of college football. Not only is all that happening around Carson Beck, but maybe earlier in the year, we could look at it and go, he was a little lamped up. Let's be honest. He hasn't played football for real in about four years. He has to find his legs a little bit. Boy, has he. Literally and figuratively. The Carson Beck we saw throwing darts against Mississippi this last Saturday is not the same dude that we saw missing open receivers the third week of the season. Not the same guy. Trust the process. This Georgia football team is a problem for college football. Tennessee this week, in their pregame press conferences, one of the things that just kept coming up is a song that's not new to us Georgia fans, but you hear it every week. There's just no drop-off. They play so many people. You can't tell one line from the next. There's no drop-off. Earlier this year, when I was talking about, listen, guys, this roster's young, more than 50% of it is two years or fresher on campus. Give them a minute, let them grow, let them figure it out. All of that effort, strain, work, patience, it's all paying off right now in November. All of those players now represent quality, depth that has played and has grown up and is contributing to what is now a Georgia Bulldogs championship season. We've rattled off the names on this show a lot. Damon Wilson, C.J. Allen, Raylan Wilson, Jordan Hall, Jonel Aguero. There are many, many more. We've even seen a lot of Monroe Freeling maybe more than we thought we would see, and others. Speaks to the recruiting, the overall strength of the program, and the development of what Kirby Smart and his coaching staff have built in Athens. Right now, when it feels like everyone else is maybe feeling the pressure, is maybe feeling the strain of having gone through summer camp, fall camp, now you're 10 weeks into the season. Everybody's banged up, beat up. And you look up and you see that monster that is the Georgia Bulldogs surging, rising, and just begging college football. Give us a challenge. Give us something to go hunt. This Georgia football team has leveled up. They're not done yet. 
this Georgia football team is a problem for the rest of college football. Think back a few weeks. I sat right here and I said, well, Brock Bowers is hurt. And we are about to get into what everyone knows is going to be the most difficult stretch of our season. I talked about how that could be daunting. And now there was real reason to question certain aspects of what lay ahead. Then I sort of tried to spin it forward for you. And I said, well, you have the hated gators on the St. John's River. The dog should go take care of that business. Then we're going to get Missouri, who is a good football team. But we get them between the hedges. They're going to be nationally ranked. That's going to be a good win if they can pull it off. And the dogs did just that. That Missouri team, they're now a top 10 team. Three weeks ago, I said at least one of these matchups is going to be a top 10 matchup. I had my eyes on the Ole Miss Rebels, and sure enough, they rolled into between the hedges a top 10 program. And this Georgia Bulldogs team put a 50-piece on them and announced to the rest of college football what was coming. Over 600 yards of total offense, 300 yards on the ground. There was a lot that happened around that Mississippi game, and we're going to get into all that. But just remember what I said when I was talking about all this stuff. I asked you to consider what it would look like if the dogs got to the other side. There's one leg of this journey remaining. That's the trip to Knoxville to take on Tennessee. Tennessee is still ranked inside the top 20. All the streaks are still intact. The consecutive game's winning streak now sits at 27. 28 would make history in Knoxville for more than one reason. But there's one really big reason that I'm sort of sitting on to see if the dogs can pull it off. I ask you to think about what it would look like if we moved one month into the future. What would the perception of Georgia be? What would the team look like if they had, in fact, gone through a really tough stretch of games and come out still undefeated on the other side? We're this close to having that be a reality. I think I can go ahead and just give you a little nugget. The history that's out in front of Georgia this week against Tennessee. Since the SEC split into divisions in 1992, no college football program or head coach has gone undefeated in regular season SEC play in three consecutive years. If Kirby Smart and the Georgia Bulldogs get the win on Rocky Top on Saturday, that will be the first time in Southeastern Conference history during the modern era that that feat has been accomplished. You might just take a second and say, well, let's throw it on top of the stack of stuff that this team is accomplishing during this run. It's tempting, but I'm going to ask you to not do that. If you're here, you know what it is to live, play, and survive in the SEC. You fully appreciate the run that Georgia is on right now. But when you... Put it through that lens, the history of this conference, the coaches that have been here, the fabulous teams that have been national champions. No one has done what Georgia has the opportunity to do this Saturday at Neyland Stadium 
in Knoxville, Tennessee. So if we wake up on Sunday morning and the dogs are 11 and 0, undefeated, and staring down the barrel of a visit to Atlanta to take on the Jackets to finish the season with another undefeated regular season. I hope your coffee tastes stronger, your orange juice tastes sweeter, the sun shines on your face, because it will be a good day to be a Georgia Bulldog on that day. There's a lot going on here. There's a lot that's happened this week. There's a lot that has led us up to this point to get us ready to discuss what's ahead. Let's just back it up one week. Let's just talk about Ole Miss real quick. As I had alluded to, a top 10 matchup between the hedges and the dogs went out there and just, they they performed better than I believe I could have ever expected them to perform. Especially coming off the week that they had had prior. A hard-fought game at home against Missouri. And they just sort of leveled up again. And to be quite honest, they eviscerated the Rebels Saturday night. On senior night. We're going to get to that here in just a second too. But we have to start at the beginning if we're talking about the Ole Miss game. What was the news of that week? Leading up to the game, the the question was, will Brock Bowers make his return? Now, I will admit, heading into the game, I thought Brock would dress. I thought he would take the field. I did not expect him to play the way he played. Saturday night, not as long, not as many snaps, or to look as good. If it's possible, me, someone who has sang Brock's praises since I've had this microphone, underestimated the man that is Brock Bowers. But I did make a call. There were a lot of people following the Vanderbilt game who said, Zero chance he returns. He's going to hang him up, move on to his future. And I answered that bell the very next day and said, you don't know this dude. I have a reminder. Let's take a look. Somebody tried to tell you. I guess you've heard the news by now. Brock Bauer suffered a high ankle sprain and is going to miss the next four to six weeks after having the tight rope surgery. There's a lot to be concerned about there if you're a dog fan. But the one thing you don't have to worry about is whether or not Brock Bowers is going to shut it down. That's not who this guy is. This is a guy that's going to work his ass off every day to get back with his teammates because there's a lot of hunting left to do. What does he say to you that he decided to come back? Well, people called him and told him that, and, and those people will not be representing him. I can promise you that because all I did was piss him off. And he said, I have, I have people call and, and tell me that I shouldn't play, coach. And, he said, that just drives me crazy and wants me to play, wants me, makes me want to play more to prove them wrong. He said, why am I in this game if I'm not going to come back and play? Beck will throw it into the end zone. There's Bowers. Touchdown right under the goal post. Eight-yard touchdown strike, Brock. I mean, they're, they're, he's, not, he's not risking millions, guys. He's, he's, he's has an opportunity to get more millions. Like, it's the other way. It's not the way because he's a great player. The NFL knows people heal. Like, they heal from that injury. They've had tons of that same injury in the NFL. So all he did was go out and stamp himself as a, a, a warrior that said, I'm going to go out and practice on Tuesday in front of 15 scouts. Then I'm going to practice on Wednesday in front of 12 scouts, and they're all going to be over going, oh, my God. And he's got an opportunity to move up. I told him, how about them fucking dogs? That's what I told him. That was this guy. And that's no big, like, feat on my part. If you've paid attention, you knew You knew nothing about hanging it up sounded like something Brock Bowers was going to do. That just is not who that guy is. And yet, people were still out here telling you, obviously, as Coach alluded to there, agents, NFL types, you shouldn't play. I loved the fact 
that coach came out and spoke on behalf of his player. Brock had a chance to answer that question directly to the media later in the week. And like the dude that he is, and like the professional that he is, he didn't take that bait. He didn't have to because his coach went out there and did it for him. All Brock had to do was show up and play the game the only way he knows how, which is wide ass open. He did say, the only thing I care about was getting back out there with my brothers, back out there with my teammates, because I wanted to go play. We've got a lot yet to do. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. That was his sentiment. I can't say that I've ever been more proud than to hear him come out and say something like that because clearly I walked out on a limb. I thought it was a pretty strong limb. <laughs> but to see him come out and do that, that young man just deserves damn good dog status from now to forever. It's not up for debate. Doesn't matter what happens the rest of the way. There shall be no Brock, Brock Bowers slander, at least not on this channel, in perpetuity. Now, there is a lot, like I said, that happened against Ole Miss. Something else that I think is worth our attention tonight is in case it sort of whizzed past you with the fire hose of information that is Georgia football the Georgia senior class for this year went 22 and 0 at home in Sanford Stadium. Of all the numbers that might get your attention in this run, so many consecutive games, so many consecutive SEC wins, this one just hadn't been mentioned. So I wanted to take a second and just say it out loud. The senior class here in 2023 went 22 and 0 at home during their time in Athens. That's incredible. That number is incredible. All of these numbers are incredible. That one somehow feels even more special. So senior night was a big deal. When you look back on it now, you're like, how did Ole Miss ever think that they had a chance in this game? Now, of course, those type wins, that type sentiment, especially when you put it in conjunction with what you just, you know, we discussed Brock said about wanting to be with his teammates, his friends, his brothers. That's the sort of thing that is the lifeblood, the sustaining tie in a program that not only breeds excellence, but demands excellence as you move forward. That is why year after year after year, the impact of players like George Davis and the Kobe Dean and Brock Bowers and these guys just carries forward. You go win, you go play for those dudes because you see how hard they've worked. And when you put good day after good day after good day, you end up with 22-0 and 0 in a career at the University of Georgia, 22-0 and 0 at home. Seriously, these numbers, they boggle your mind. Now, when they got that win and they announced their presence with authority to the rest of college football over the weekend, it just so happened that the dogs did something else. Put it on the wall. 2023 SEC East champs. The third consecutive division title for the Georgia Bulldogs. They talk about it a lot. We own the East. Everything runs through Athens. Now forever, 23 is going to hang on the wall. At least that part of the mission, you can say, was fully accomplished against Missouri, 
or I'm sorry, against Ole Miss on Saturday. Now, there was some other stuff that was happening around the conference that day, and the way things shook out, we now know the future. The Dogs have earned a date in Atlanta to take on Alabama in the SEC championship game. Inevitably, some would say, we're right at the matchup that everyone wants to see. I see people already saying this game is the national championship game. Now, I don't know that I'm going to go whole hog on that just yet, but I'm not going to push back too hard either. It's going to be a big one. A few more twists and turns this year in the SEC than maybe some of us saw, particularly on the western side of the bracket. But here we are. Georgia and Alabama. Before the Dogs won their national title, people used to ask me, who do you want to see in Atlanta if Georgia wins the game or wins the East? My answer was always the same because I'm talking about over the last decade, so, you know, during Kirby's time in Athens. The answer was always the same. I hope it's Alabama because I wanted my dogs to play the best. I wanted to know what kind of program we had. Win or lose didn't matter. I wanted to play the best. And there have been some fabulous games between these two since Kirby got back to Athens. I expect this one will be another. But there's no other team that I would want to face. Are you as excited about it as I am? Because, I mean, I have never been shy about saying how much respect I have for Nick Saban and for this program that he's built in Alabama. But I'm also not shy about saying that as we sit here today, the power inside the conference rests in Athens, Georgia. So you bet I'm excited about this matchup. Let's settle in on the field. And then everything else will shake itself out from there. So the dogs took care of their business. But there's some national business that had to be attended to as well. And some of it was out of George's hands a little bit. But at the end of the day, it kind of shook out the way I thought it was gonna. And of course, I'm referring to the college football playoff and their third set of rankings here in 2023. Now, you may have seen it. I posted a video before the rankings came out saying that I thought the committee was going to go Georgia 1, Ohio State 2, Michigan 3, and Washington at 4. Now, that's just me trying to figure out what a group of people in a room are going to do. In this instance, that's also the way I think it should have been. Because if you're going to talk to me at all about resume and those sorts of things, I think Washington should get the edge here over Florida State. But at the end of the day, these teams are going to play. Washington and Oregon are going to play. There's going to be movement. But for now, Georgia sits in the one spot in the college football rankings. And I'm not somebody who's going to argue, you know, the number 13 versus nine spot or, or why is Tennessee still ranked or, you know, should Alabama be in front of Texas? I, I'm, I have no interest in that right now. The only thing I'm interested in is, you know, of course, where my team is. And right now, they're at the top of the mountain, exactly where they ended last season. So if they handle their business the rest of the way out, Georgia should be the one seed as we move into the playoff. And that's important because you get to do 
the regional thing, right, and pick where you would want to play. There's no doubt that whoever wins the SEC championship, uh, if they make it into the playoff, is going to choose to play at the Sugar Bowl in New Orleans just simply because of wear and tear and travel and turnaround and all that sort of stuff. So that is important. But it's like Coach said, the players don't care. They don't care. As long as they're one of those four, it's all good. But it does make for pretty good television and certainly makes for a lot of good internet and podcast discussion. And even though it's not my favorite topic in the world to discuss, here we are breaking it down and talking about it. Now, I have managed to sort of let you know where we are in the season. There is so much that has been accomplished already, but there is still so much that lies ahead and is yet to be done. This Georgia football team is a problem for the rest of college football. And there's no reason to expect that they're going to throw it in reverse anytime soon. With that said, they are almost to the other side of the biggest month of the season. Still sitting there undefeated with everything in front of them to play for. And the next thing, the one thing that's still in front of them is that trip to Rocky Top, to Knoxville, to take on the Tennessee Volunteers. Now, we all know what happened last year. It's hard for me to remember a victory that was much sweeter than the one the dogs tasted last season in Athens against the Volunteers. But this year, they have to take the show on the road. Now, champions don't care. A champion doesn't care where they play. You want to strap it up and take care of it in the parking lot? Let's do it. I don't have any concern about Georgia getting up for this game, about their prep this week, or that they're going to take Tennessee seriously. They already have the East in their back pocket. But this team, and I've said this before, it's not about perfection. There is history on the line this week. And in a way, if Georgia wins this game, they will have achieved some level of perfection. But it's not about that. It's about excellence. Perfection, which is unattainable, versus excellence. Georgia is striving to be excellent in every facet of their game in every part of their program. Tennessee is just the next opponent, the next hurdle, the next challenge for them to go chase. And I expect them to rise and meet that challenge. Now, I'm a dog fan. I can talk to you about dogs all day. That's why this channel exists. But I do know some people. And I do know enough to know that I don't know everything about the Tennessee Volunteers. So that's why tonight on the podcast, you guys, you are going to be treated to an exclusive premiere. Today, I was fortunate enough to sit down and speak with Eric Kane of the Locked on Vols podcast. We talked for almost 30 minutes, and we broke down the game completely. And I'm just going to play that out for you here so you can educate yourself about the opponent for this weekend and fully get ready for what the dogs have coming up this Saturday in Knoxville. This is my interview with Eric Kane of the Locked on Vols podcast. Enjoy. All right, everybody. Welcome back into another edition of How About That Dogs Cast. 
Today, I'm looking for a little perspective. And when I'm thinking about Tennessee Week and perspective, one of the voices that I want to find and listen to is Mr. Eric Kane from the Locked On Vols podcast. Because when you head over there, you're going to get a level-headed, rational approach in what we all know is a bit of a fanatical week. So today, Eric was nice enough to join me. Eric, how are you doing? Yeah, doing well. Appreciate you having me on. It's uh, it's always an exciting week, Tennessee and Georgia. There's no way around it. Doesn't even matter what the rankings are. But in no. this instance, we do have a ranked matchup, and it's up on Rocky Top. So from a Georgia perspective, that gets us amped up a little bit. I know that last year was at home, and and you know there was a lot of emotion around that game. But there's just something about going up there. I've made the trip up there to Rocky Top a few times, and let's just say. It gets the blood pumping a little bit, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so uh, as, as we look at this, let's just start at the beginning, because dog fans are focused on the dogs, as we should be. But if we look at Tennessee, can you sort of walk us through how we got to where we are at this point in the season? I mean, the balls are sitting there at 7-3, and three, and I'm just curious the mood of the fan base. Yeah, um, I mean, of course, you're, you're, you're coming off that really successful, really fun you know, season last year, year two. With Josh Heupel, 10, 10 wins in the regular season, eleven wins overall, and that hasn't happened here in a long time. And, and so you're you're on that high, and, and Tennessee fans always have high expectations, and that's fine. But but especially when you're coming off a year like that, and, and then you got to sit here in retrospect, and you know it's all off season. It's like, uh, I mean, there's no reason this team can't win nine games. That's what I that's what I picked Tennessee preseason was nine and three. But I'm like, man, you lost a what should have been a Heisman finalist in Hendon Hooker. The fact that he wasn't a Heisman finalist is ridiculous. Lost a Heisman finalist, lost um, the Blitnikoff Award winner in Jalen Hyatt, lost a fellow third round pick in Cedric Tillman, lost the uh, top ten offensive tackle in Darnell Wright, lost uh, Byron Young, who's in contention for Rookie of the Year year in the NFL. But you lost a lot of talent last year, so when you put it in that perspective, it's like okay, you you are going to take a step back, but you still want to take a step forward in certain areas of your ball club, and I think for the most part. Tennessee has overall I don't, last Saturday was abysmal in all parts, but the defense has taken another step and that's the third straight year. It's taken a step where it was when Josh Heupel got here. Tennessee's run game is really good. Um, you know, Tennessee's been very much a work in progress on the offensive line, but it's turning into be a pretty solid unit here at the end of the season. Again, all of this take it with a grain of salt because last time out, Tennessee was just horrendous against Missouri. Nothing went right offense or defense. But for the most part, Tennessee's uh, Tennessee's been an improving unit all year long. As far as the losses, man, it's like like Missouri. I can't explain. Missouri's a good ball club. I'm not saying that, like losing to Missouri is not shocking because I think Missouri's a good ball club. The way you lost to Missouri was completely shocking because again, nothing went right. Alabama, you had on the ropes, twenty to seven at halftime, just couldn't finish. And and then Florida, Florida is a bad football team, but just like Tennessee to Kentucky. That's what Tennessee is to Florida in terms of that. That series has just been dominated by Florida. So uh, a couple of inexplicable losses, in my opinion, Tennessee should have had Florida. Tennessee should have finished at Alabama. And, and honestly, the second quarter at Florida was horrendous. The second half at the, really the third quarter at Alabama was horrendous. You're, you're two quarters away from being undefeated going into Missouri. And then of course you get smoked by Missouri. So should have, could have, would have, is what it is. That's why you play the game. Um, Tennessee has been an improving team all year long. I think the Florida loss is the one that's most puzzling because Florida's not a good football team. You accept the Alabama loss, and uh, you got to accept the Missouri loss because as disappointing as it was, it's a good ball club, but you want to put your best foot forward. So um, it, it's kind of where I think most Tennessee fans thought it was going to be, but I don't think any Tennessee fan envisioned losing the way it did last Saturday, if that makes sense. No, it absolutely does. And I mean, obviously, I, I'm a Georgia fan of I'm 47 years old. So that's 47 years in the red and black. I've seen a few disappointing performances myself along the way. Uh, but the one I'm a firm believer in the fact that it is never as bad as you look at your worst and you're never as good as you look at your best. No. And looking at where these two teams are heading into this weekend, I really don't expect to see either of those dramatic uh, ends of the spectrum, if you know what I mean. And we can get to that defense because you talked about them being uh, an improved unit. And, and that's the first thing that I noticed over the course of the season because it doesn't really matter who you play, it's how you play, which speaks directly to your Missouri point, right? So as a volunteer fan, well, not that you are a fan, but as a volunteer fan, if you're looking at this team, uh, Joe Milton, Jalen Wright, 
Dylan Sampson. There are some names out there. Squirrel White. Why is this offense not the same? Understanding that NFL talent is NFL talent, right? Yeah. But there are still players on this unit. So what is it that maybe is misfiring that this offense isn't looking like it looked last year? It's the lack of explosive plays. Um, you know, again, Tennessee is everybody this year has been kind of like, man, well, what how weird is it for Josh Hopple to have a running football team and all this? I'm like, Josh Heupel has always run the football at Tennessee. He's averaged since the 2021 season, his first year here on Rocky Top, he's averaged 200 yards rushing a game. Um, it's always been a good running team. It's just the, the running game is kind of the uh, the focal point this year uh, because it's really good. Um, again, wasn't good at Missouri, but it's been really good. Um, but the lack of explosive plays is the biggest difference. Um, you, you had guys getting behind the defense last year. I mean, putting defensive backs on skates creating huge separation, creating mismatches. You know, Jalen Hyatt matched up on a linebacker a couple of times. I mean, that should never, ever happen. That happened a couple of times a season ago. You're not getting that type of separation on the perimeter. You're not getting that type of guys just beating defensive backs and getting wide open. It's happened a couple of times this year, but um, not as frequent as last year. And so that leads to less explosive plays. Tennessee has not connected as many passes down the football field. And I mean, a lot of it's, I honestly do think it's a combination of a lot of things. Joe Milton is not an elite quarterback. There's not many of them at points in times. He plays below average quarterback, but I think Joe Milton's an average quarterback. Um, so you're not going to hit as many down the field passes. The receivers, I think have gotten better and better as the years got on. Wasn't a very good group to begin the season. And now you've got, of course, Brew McCoy that's out for the year. He's been out for the year for about a month now. Dante Thornton's going to miss the end of the regular season. I mean, you're dropping like flies at that position right now. Um, so there's that. The offensive line, I mentioned earlier, very much a work in progress. Your, your center, Cooper Mays, was gone for the first five games. There's been a rotation at tackles because of injuries at both left and right tackle. Um, it, it's, been a, it's been a number of different things, but all that kind of sums up to the lack of explosive plays that Josh Heupel's kind of hung his hat on as a play caller in this league. And so... Um, again, it's gotten better as the year's gone on at points in time since he's run the fo football well. Joe Milton is certainly playing much better football now at the end of the year than he was in September. And uh, there, there's been some good performances. There's been some good throws. Um, there's been some points, but not a whole lot of points, not a whole lot of explosive plays. And and really, this is kind of the first time under Josh Heupel as a play caller um, in this league and as a head coach that that's kind of happened. So let's drill down for just a second. I mean, you've mentioned the moving parts on offense, especially along the line and, and a rotation at various positions. I mean, the dogs certainly know a little something about injuries this year. Even with that, this running game was something that had everyone's attention early in the season, but it seems to have, I don't want to say fully evaporated, but it doesn't seem to be the same. Yet, maybe from an outsider's perspective, the offensive line seems to be having more consistency in the unit that's trotting out there. So can you put your finger on why that might be, or am I just completely misreading it? Well, I think the, uh, as far as the Tennessee run game, I mean, it's, it, it's, um, I mean, last Saturday was not good, um, obviously. And then you played UConn, which was just a nothing game and the stats were inflated. The stats were good there. But if you go back to, you know, Tennessee's previous SEC game before that, I mean, t at Kentucky, you know, Tennessee ran the football so well, ran it in the fourth quarter to ice the game. Um, Tennessee's had big rushing performances against South Carolina, against Texas A&M. Didn't run the football as well against Alabama. Joe Milton did. Joe Milton ran the football really well against Alabama. Uh, so, so in terms of the run game, I think it's been kind of present all year long. Now, last week was bad. You need to respond. And, and, and that's interesting. Um, we'll see if Tennessee can bounce back and run the football against Georgia. Tennessee's not been able to run the football against Georgia under Josh Heupel. Um, I think it was like, I think 2021 against Alabama, Tennessee had like 43 rushing yards, which was horrendous. Tennessee had 83 rushing yards against Missouri last week, which was a season low by a lot. I mean, this team averages 250 yards on the ground right now, and they rush for 83 yards. So they need a bounce back effort for sure, but Tennessee's not been able to run the football against Georgia. So I think that's a big time key um, here in these three years they've played under Josh Heupel. So um, the run game has been pretty consistent all year long to answer the question. Now, the offensive line, getting Cooper Mays back and getting him back into game shape, not only game shape, but the Tennessee tempo shape I think was big. Everything starts with the center, and he's he's kind of rounding into midseason form right now, which is good because, in my opinion, he's one of the better centers in this league. 
Um, you, you've settled in with who you want your starting five to be, but Gerald Mincy has been banged up a right tackle. He's been kind of in and out of the lineup. John Campbell, the Miami transfer, has kind of been in and out because he's been banged up a little bit. Um, your left guard, Ollie Lane, has been a career backup, and he actually had to play center the first five games of the season when Cooper Mays is out. So, again, it's been very much musical chairs, but they know the five that they want out there. When healthy, it's a pretty sound unit. It's a, it's a group that's kind of been gelling together in a little bit, and a big reason why this Tennessee run game's been what it was. It's it's unique the way they block it, man. I mean, they're going to pull tackles. They're going to block down with guards. Center's going to pull. They're going to kick out the in-man on the line of scrimmage. They're going to fold up with an H back and and go get the middle linebacker. It's it's really cool to see how Glenn Ellerby, the offensive lineman and run game coordinator, along with Joey Halsley and Josh Heupel, kind of kind of you know enter a game in terms of how they want to do the run game. And so uh, they'll have to add their heads together and figure some things out again against Georgia because, like I said, Tennessee's not been able to run against Georgia the past three two years. I 100 percent agree with you that that is a huge key to the game. Um, and seeing what they can do on the ground is going to go a long way in determining whether or not that line is accurate this weekend or not, I think. Um, so let's look at that defense now. We, we looked at the offense uh, pretty in-depth there. So as far as the defense is concerned, you think about them, at least when I think of them, I think of them as getting after the passer this year. That's something they can do. I see them as being big, physical, and athletic. Um, so who are some of the names that dog fans should be familiar with if they're going to be a burr under Carson Beck's saddle this weekend. Yeah, uh, first and foremost, number one name is, is James Pierce. Uh, number 27 off the end. He's tall. He's long. Um, he's, he's you know, he's put on some weight from, from last year, but only a sophomore. He's a young pup, but, man, he's good. Speed. He will beat you with speed off the edge. Um, he's got a good swim move. He, he's still learning the finer techniques and everything of being an edge rusher, but uh, at one point in time, I want to say he was second to Dallas Turner in the league in sacks. I haven't checked that leaderboard here lately, but um, he's been a good player for sure. So James Pierce, number 27. Tyler Barron, number nine. Man, this is his senior year, and for the first time in his career, um, you know, knock on wood, if you're a Tennessee fan, I mean, he's playing 40, 45 snaps a game. Um, he's staying healthy. He's been He's not been missing practice. And so all of that has helped him become a better player. And at one point in time, he was up there in the leaderboard in terms of sacks in the Southeastern Conference. So James Pierce on one side, Tyler Barron on the other. Tennessee's got two pretty good pass rushers. Um, and then in the interior, I mean, Tennessee will play 10 to 12 guys on the defensive line. Uh, that, that's that's kind of a Rodney Garner staple. And, uh, you know, Omar Norman Lodge, Omari Thomas, Bryson Eason, I mean, those guys – those guys play big snaps, and, and and they've been able to get after the passer from the interior as well. So Tennessee's strength is on its defensive line, no doubt about it. It's been a little inconsistent, you know, latter portion of the season. Um, you know, t- Tennessee from the second half of Alabama about a month ago, prior to the Missouri game, Tennessee had had like one sack, and that came off an intentional grounding, and, and so it kind of went, it kind of went MIA there for about two and a half weeks. Tennessee wasn't getting getting home, getting to the quarterback and bringing him down. Tennessee responds with three first half sacks against uh, against uh, Brady Cook last week and then, you know, doesn't touch him in the second half. So it needs to kind of get back to the consistency that it was earlier in the season. But again, it's a good unit. Linebackers, big time transfer from BYU. Keenan Peely plays one football game against Virginia in the opener. You know, tears his, tears his tricep and, and he's been out. And that's been, it's been a huge loss for Tennessee because you like the linebacker group but it's young it's inexperienced and with that injury you had to put forth a sophomore and he's a starter now and he's super green he's learning on the fly and not very good out of the box and still you know still still trying to I mean, it's, it's game 11 coming up so he's gotten you know used to being a starter as the years gone on but very young at linebacker beside Aaron Beasley who um, Aaron Beasley is a really good player, but I think he's not 100% right now, and I think you're kind of kind of seeing that in his play the last month or so. But uh, So good good defensive line, very much a work in progress at linebacker. And, and then, as you know, man, it's all tied in. And when the defensive line's playing well, Tennessee's secondary's pretty good. When Tennessee's uh, defensive line's not getting home, it's exposing that defensive backfield back there. Um, Kamal Haddon was one of the best cornerbacks in America, uh, cover corners, you know, through – six, seven games. He's out for the season, unfortunately. Um, so it, it's been uh, it's been kind of a rotation of cornerback to help kind of fill that void. You got two safeties that'll play every snap of the football game and and, and they're you know they're they're old, they're experienced, they know where to be. I think they lack um, 
some athleticism. I think they lack some speed over the top. And, um, yeah, so Tennessee's defense, again, a point in time has been really good. I mean, Tennessee, you don't win South Carolina game. You don't win A&M game. I mean, you don't, you don't do a lot of things that you did as the season's gone along without the defense. But trying to kind of hold it together and get back to playing consistent football here in the latter portion of the season is, is kind of the charge for the Tennessee defense. Well, you kind of stole my thunder there because I was going to ask about Haddon and just how that looked on the back end. Yeah, allow like, me to go step by step, player by player, and talk for thirty minutes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, on the whole, though, it sounds like it's been a little bumpy on the back end with Haddon being out of there. I mean, that's probably an understatement because, like you said, he was a really top shelf corner of the first half of the season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was good, man, and, and um. He's a guy that um, has has not always been that that good, <laughs> and um, he's a guy that has, for reasons you know, talked smack over the years, and, and he got burned and talked smack, you know, just 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 defensive back stuff, right? Yeah. And uh, fans didn't like that. Fans didn't like that at all. And then it, it kind of took um, you know, Tennessee fans about five or six games this year to be like, wait a minute, that guy's good. <laughs> that guy's really good this year. And, and it's like just when they were kind of starting to appreciate. The play of Kamal Haddon, he gets hurt. It's just really unfortunate. But, I mean, he was one of the, the uh, SEC leaders in interceptions. Um, according to Pro Football Focus, he was a, the top-graded cornerback in the league. Um, I mean, you, you go and you'll find a stat, he was up there. So, it's been unfortunate. Again, Gabe Judy Lally, formerly a Vanderbilt, formerly a BYU experienced guy. He's out there at cornerback. Nico Slaughter's out there at cornerback. A um, little bit of Brandon Turnage. You know, Ricky Gibson's a true freshman. And so, yeah, it's... It's been trying to find that right right piece to kind of kind of overcompensate for the loss that Kamal had, and then again, I continue to say when the when the line is getting home and affecting the passer, I mean you you can hide a lot of that, um, but at points and times when it's not, Georgia's offensive line's given up nine sacks on the year, so they're gonna have their hands full. Uh, you got you got to kind of bring your lunch pail back there in the defensive backfield. So I mentioned this earlier uh, when I looked at the looked at the Tennessee ball season. Before the season began, when I was at SEC Media Days trying to figure out who was going to end up where, I pegged Tennessee at nine and three, very easily could finish at eight and four, right? I saw there was a, a coin flip game in there. So that's about where they are. Now, I, I look at this unit and I'm not surprised at where they are, but I'm not a Tennessee Vols fan. So as a volunteer fan, what is the temperature of the fan base here as they sit at seven and three with the opportunity for a Florida bowl game still on the table, but not a lot else? How are they feeling? Uh, do they are they still ride or die or, or are you seeing a lot of tickets being sold to Georgia fans this week? Well, I mean, they're pissed off after last week. <laughs> I think it's safe to say um, and, and you can't blame them. I mean, what, what happened last week was just. Very uncharacteristic. Like, I mean, I'll say this, you know, Josh Heupel the last two years, you, you hadn't lost many games under Josh Heupel, but when Tennessee loses, man, it loses, right? I mean, being outscored 27 nothing in the second half to Alabama, being outscored like 21, 22, no, whatever it was in the second quarter of Florida, uh, South Carolina game last year, you know, what what happened? I mean, a lot of people with the whole sign stealing scheme out there, it's like, well, what happened? Because that was just an inexplicable loss defensively, just the meltdown of all meltdowns. Um, and then and then Missouri this past week. So it's been it's been a little confusing. Like this team's won a lot of games, but when it loses, it loses. So anyway, coming off last week, I mean Tennessee fans are frustrated. And I get it. Uh again, I I feel like the loss is not the issue. It's how you're losing these games. Um, you now have two November collapses, essentially, in terms of, you know, j just the lopsided scores. Now, November losses last year, I mean, so, so you lost to Georgia, your Tennessee, best team in the country, on the road is what it is. You go to South Carolina, and, and like, you lose that one. Tennessee's often still put up 34 points or whatever. Um, but that loss, it was just inexplic inexplicably on the defense, and that loss knocked you out of the college football playoff. So that was just a horrible loss last year. So, again, the loss of Missouri, it's not that you lost to Missouri. It's how you lost to it. So, anyway, fans are frustrated. Um, I think level-headed fans, and I think fans that um, you know were kind of honest about themselves saw, um, you know, 9-3 and three was very attainable. Um, you, you still had some people going 10-2, and two, and that's fine. Um some you know every year you'll have some eleven and ones you know <laughs> but like that's that just wasn't gonna happen but I, I think I think realistic fans you know were some were ten and two and that's fair but a lot were nine and three uh, nine and three was my preseason pick and um, 
essentially you got to win this game if you're Tennessee, if you want to get to that nine and three plateau. If not, then you're likely going to finish eight and four with a win over Vanderbilt next week. And I think personally, eight and four is a tad disappointing. Um, it's not fire the head coach. It's not, you know, fire the offensive coordinator time. It's not any of that. It's just, um, you, you kind of look at these losses and it's like losing to Alabama. Okay, but how did you lose it? Like I said, losing to Florida, that should never have happened because Florida is not a good football team. Um, the way I, it, it's the way you're losing these games, I think is disappointing. So for anything, I mean, I'm not picking Tennessee to win on Saturday against Georgia. Spoilers. It just after seeing what happened last week, I I, I couldn't be taken seriously. I feel like doesn't mean Tennessee can't win. I think Tennessee can play with anybody in the country. I just don't trust Tennessee right now. Um, but but you're you're really hoping if you're a fan of Tennessee that you you make it a ball game and you come back and play good football and play, you know, the way you're capable of at home and against Georgia, a really good football program. Uh, because if you if you get blown out again, it's just like man, like you're sitting at eight and four with a couple blowouts, and it's like that's really disappointing. So I would think if you finish eight and four, it's a tad disappointing, um, just because of how you lost those games. You know, year three where where Josh Heupel took over the program, I think if you would have said in, in year three or eight and four, take it every – and that's not even counting what happened last year. You take it every day, all day, for sure. So um, I, I think that's kind of how you view that and all that. So uh, we'll see what happens. I, I think the biggest thing is how does Tennessee respond against Georgia? Again, you might not win the football game, but but can you get back to doing what you do best and, and seeing, seeing where things are in the fourth quarter? And I think Tennessee can certainly make it a ball game in the fourth quarter, but it's got to run the football. It's got to stop the run. Now, prior to the season, I had looked at the Tennessee game, as everyone did, and thought, okay, that could be a big game, right, just because of where it is in the season and the two teams in the recent history. But I had pegged Auburn and Ole Miss as flashing red light games that Georgia needed to look out for simply because of who those teams were and where those games fell in the season. As I look at Tennessee now, I still feel excited about coming up there and playing this game. This is a big conference game, even with the division already decided. My question for you is, which team shows up for Tennessee? What is going to determine the outcome of this game from a Tennessee Volunteers perspective? It's a good question. Um, you have two Tennessee football teams, Tennessee at home and Tennessee on the road. Thankfully for Tennessee, this game's in Neyland Stadium. You're playing at home. Uh, you've won 14 straight games at Neyland Stadium. I know Georgia's won 27 straight, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, so something's going to give here, right? And you're you, you are yourself at home. Um, you know Tennessee wasn't handling the road environment well at, at in Athens last year. God, it was deafening that day. Um, and uh, didn't handle the road environment of Florida earlier this year. Handled the road environment of Alabama and Kentucky and, and Missouri, just just didn't finish and didn't play well. But anyway, Tennessee's a much better football team at home. I think for Tennessee, again, to to pull off this, this upset, um, I mean, the fact that this is a nine and a half point spread, 10 point spread, I mean, that, that show, I mean, there's, there's mansions in the desert. Vegas is saying, okay, I mean, Tennessee shouldn't win, but they have a chance to win. This is not going to be a blowout. I think that says a lot about what Vegas thinks about this matchup and what, what could happen. Um, for Tennessee to win this game, though, You've got again. You got to run the football. You got to go back to doing what you do best, and that and that's that's running the football and that's stopping the run. Because you know, I asked Josh Heupel this last week, heading into the Missouri game. I was like, when you have an offense you're trying to defend that does a little everything well, how do you balance that and, and try to take something away? And he said, you always, always have to take the run away first because just like we, you know, Tennessee, Josh Heupel's words, everybody can build off the run. So. Uh, Tennessee's got to run the football, take away the run. And I think, it, I think it'll be important for Tennessee. Tennessee's going to have to steal a possession. Um, is that, you know, faking a punt on fourth and fourth 50? Is that, um, you know, going for a couple of fourth downs? You know, is that an interception or, or forced turnover defensively? I don't know. But I think Tennessee's going to have to steal a possession at some point in time in this football game because you're going to need a little bit of help. I look at the uh, Tennessee-Alabama game last year. And for as good as Tennessee was, Tennessee would have to play perfect to win that game. Um, kind of similar to, to this game, I feel like. Maybe not perfect, because I don't think Georgia, you know, knock on wood, going into this game. I mean, you know, you could see Alabama last year, you know, putting up 50 plus points. Georgia is a really good offense, and Georgia scores a lot of points, I think averaging 40 points a game. But like, I, I don't see Georgia putting up 55 points. Um, and so it may, maybe doesn't have to be like perfect on every single drive, but. You got to be really good. <laughs> You've got to be really, really good. 
and uh, finish drives in the red zone. Tennessee's not a good red zone football team. Um, I just think more than anything, you've got to do what you do well and create some havoc in terms of stealing a possession. And I think that's kind of the formula to to not only being in this football game, but having a chance to win it in the fourth quarter. Well, Eric, I want to thank you again for taking time to come on here and put a little bit of an orange hue over all this red and black that you see on the screen here with me. If you will, take just a second and let Dog Nation know if they're interested in learning more about the Tennessee Vols and a level-headed perspective where they can find your work. Yeah, I mean, I talked here nonstop for 35 minutes, so I'm sure your your listeners don't want to know anything else about Tennessee. But if you do, uh, check out Locked on Balls. Uh, 30 minutes or less, heading into the ball game. Be the smartest guy at the tailgate. That's what I tell our listeners. Whether you're a Dogs fan, a Balls fan, you're going to learn all about Tennessee, the matchups, and and kind of my thoughts and, and our thoughts heading into this football game. So that's Locked on Balls wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube. Eric, thank you so much for taking time to come in and sitting in on the How About That <laughs> Dogs cast. It's been a great talk. And our fans are better off for it. We'll talk to you on the other side, friend. Sounds great. Thank you. I told them how about them fucking dogs. That's what I told them. <laughs>